Okay, so let's just get to the very essence of how you started playing soccer. Okay, yeah. Um, growing up, my parents really wanted me to get involved in sports, and I tried a, pl- a plethora of different sports. I, I played volleyball. I tried basketball. wasn't good at it. Um, I did horseback riding for a little bit in soccer, of course, and ultimately it came down between choosing between soccer and horseback riding, and as much as I loved horseback riding, it, it wasn't for me. I wasn't great, um, so that's kind of how I got into soccer, and then uh, growing up, my parents got me into the competitive and the club. And then I joined a league called ECNL, which was pretty big at the time growing up. And it, it really helped me get college exposure with different coaches. And then ultimately that's how I ended up at BG. Um, the coach at the time contacted me and fell in love with the campus, uh, the environment, the teammates, the coaching staff and all the facilities that they had. So that's a little bit on how I got into soccer and then ended up at Bowling Green. So I was a goalkeeper and I understand that the college recruiting starts at the keeper and then kind of fills in the pieces. Mm -hmm. What point did you realize that you could play collegiately? How old were you? Um, you know, it's funny you ask that because it depended on the team that I was on for my club team. I wasn't always the superstar and that it, it got frustrating because all my close friends were receiving offers from power five schools going into the military, Uh, My best friend played at Kansas and it was frustrating because that wasn't me. I wasn't getting those big looks. Um, So when BG reached out to me, I was so thankful that a division one program was interested in me. Couldn't say no to that. Um, And what was the rest of the question? (laughs) Oh, just, I mean, what age were you when those offers came in? Oh, right, right. Um, It's, I think recruiting started, it was younger. I know it's different, so much different now. Um, recruiting started about sophomore year freshman sophomore year in high school is when we could start reaching out to colleges and I knew I loved soccer I I thrived in high school soccer um, club soccer I did well when I was younger and then once I got into the highly competitive that was more I wasn't the top person I wasn't the best player on the team Um, but that just made me want to work harder to get that that scholarship so I'd say probably sophomore to junior year I was like wait I think I could really go play division one college soccer and then that's a huge difference from Colorado to Ohio (laughs) I mean even your the teammates that you already mentioned stayed rather close to home Mm -hmm. I mean you were across the country (laughs) yeah I get that a lot actually um you know a big reason why I wanted to go so far from home well, there's actually a few. My mom would always tell me, you know what, Rach, like you're, you're going to get on a plane to go somewhere. So the time doesn't really matter. So go as far away as you want to go. So that was kind of one thing that I kept in mind. And then my parents actually met at a small college in Michigan. So, and I have family in Michigan, so I'm kind of familiar with the Midwest and being in Colorado, we always go West. We go to California, um, Arizona, those States. So I was like, I want to check out a different part of the country. And I think Ohio in and of itself has really made me realize how, how blessed I am to be from Colorado. There's more hills there. (laughs) The weather's a little bit nicer than Northwest Ohio. So yeah. And then were you always a defender and who was your soccer inspiration growing up? Um, I was not always a defender. I always joke about it. I was actually recruited as a forward. And then I got here uh, freshman year and I think my coach was like, "Mm, no, (laughs) that's not, you're not great at that. Uh, So then they put me to uh, outside back and then it wasn't until my true senior year um, and then redshirt year where I found my center back position that I was like, no, this is, this is what I love. And I felt like I really thrived in it. Um, And then my soccer inspiration as a player, I really look up to Julie Ertz. I like her worth at work ethic um and how she plays I think she is am I like can I say badass (laughs) I think she's awesome uh she's probably my biggest inspiration when it comes to to a soccer player did you see the announcement on Twitter I just realized that I'm so excited (laughs) so excited she's awesome and I just I love them together but oh yeah getting back to you (laughs) um what were the the resources like at a D1 school that is not necessarily like a huge, like soccer powerhouse, I would say necessarily. 
Um, the resources have definitely changed over time. You know, I from hearing and comparing to my friends at Play at Power Five Conference, they have nutrition stations, nutritionists that work with them, work with, work directly with the team. And you know, at BG, we have that, but it's not always utilized. Um, I know they have more like sports psychologists, um, incredible medical facilities. Facilities and BG, I mean, they do have that. Don't get me wrong, but we don't have people who work individually with the teams. It's more a generalized, they work with BG athletics. Uh, so I think that was a little bit, that was very different, I guess, uh, between a BG school and then bigger schools. So let's, let's get into that mental health resources specifically. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are you working with? Um, we had, I don't know if you've ever heard her name's Bernie Compton. She worked with us. She actually came in my freshman year um as a mental performance coach and she worked directly with our team she is an avid soccer fan loves the game huge supporter of women's sports incredible person she came and worked with us uh in 2016 with the team did a bunch of team bonding uh all that fun stuff and then she just stuck around the team now she's our director of operations and she dealt, still does the the counseling and stuff but she is more so focused on uh, the director of operations kind of stuff. And then we also had another coach that worked with our team. I think it was only for about a year. And she also did like team bonding, mental skills. I ended up meeting with her one-on-one -on -one because during that time I was struggling mentally with the game. And so I reached out to her and we did a bunch of different meetings. We met on the field, we met in a classroom, anywhere, <laughs> you name it, we did it. So. Yeah, it's interesting that you diversified your meeting places. Last week's interview actually focused on, she's from New Zealand, and she was talking about how she didn't utilize sports psychology resources that Team New Zealand had because they weren't applicable, because she felt like they were only, she was only learning about them in a classroom, and then they weren't taking them outside and right. using practical experience to utilize them. Did that make a difference for you that that changed the places that you were practicing those skills? Yeah, it definitely did. I think the best one and the most applicable to myself was when we would go out on the field, um, teaching me different skills and cues. The biggest thing was like the, the self-talk and how to bounce back after a mistake. Um, I think that I used those skills not only in soccer, but in my daily life and also especially in my rehab when I went through both my ACLs. Um, but the location, it plays a major role in how those skills were, were effective to me. Um, practicing them on the field or in our tent that we have on the field, uh, that was the most beneficial to me with those skills. What did you find yourself utilizing most of the skills that you did learn? I mean, was it visualization? Were there focus exercises that you really felt in tune with? I mean, what did you find worked the best? My favorite thing that I got from that was definitely learning. And it's so simple, but so hard to master was using keywords. Um, I know a lot of athletes struggle with getting down on themselves and how they're going to bounce back after a mistake. And that was my biggest thing. I wasn't always a, a, a great soccer player. And when I would make a mistake, I'd put so much pressure on myself. Um, I knew my coach was watching me. I knew my teammates were watching me. And then that would just, it was a domino effect. I would self-destruct at that point. Um, so just understanding I guess my biggest thing was understanding that like I am human I'm not a perfect soccer player I wish I was but nobody is um, I'm gonna be make mistakes and I, I have to be okay with that and using those there are a bunch of different keywords and just mental things or like little actions that I would do that okay I messed up let's move on like get the next one you can't dwell on the past focus on what's going to come up next so I think that was probably the best thing that helped me um, with my soccer is that an easy process to learn? It's, it's easy to learn, but it's hard to master. It, it definitely took, I wouldn't say that I, I got confident with that skill until probably my fifth year. Yeah, it took a while. Yeah, I mean, that it's so easy to talk about them as just kind of infinite skill learning activities. But when you're right. faced with, okay, I have this amount of college eligibility, Let's yeah. try to use it to the fullest. Mm -hmm, it definitely. Kind of puts a a timestamp on on how fast you have to learn these kind of skills. And you had 
even less time to learn them because you were injured for a mm -hmm. lot of your of your yeah. college time. Yeah. And starting freshman year, <laughs> you had barely played any with your new team and suddenly you had an injury. I mean, practice. Right. How do you how do you formulate who you're going to be at that college when you're already injured? I didn't, <laughs> I guess is the best way to answer that. I always think back and reflecting on my, my past six years. And I, I always say, I wish that my, my fifth year or even senior year, my true senior year, I was like, I wish that was my freshman year because I felt like I finally got into a groove as an athlete. I understand who I was as a woman, what things work for me, what things don't. And it, it took four years, three to four years to actually understand and get to know myself and what worked and what didn't. So it, it does, it takes, you got to be patient. And then you missed the entirety of 2017's fall season. Mm -hmm. As you were watching your teammates compete, what were you thinking? I mean, it, no injury is fun. No athlete wants to sit out and missing a whole season is it's hard. It's really hard, but the, the best thing I could have done and the best way that I interacted with the team was I was their biggest cheerleader. You needed water. I got you water. Call me a water girl at that point. I wanted the team to win so bad. And I would, I, anything I could do to be involved with the team, to help out, set up different exercises, help after the games, anything I could do to be involved. That's what I would take advantage of. I'm such a people person that if, if I could help out and make the team that much more successful, even though I'm not contributing on the field, I do whatever it takes off the field to make sure I could give what I can so that they can be successful. Yeah, I think that I've interviewed a couple of people who have returned from serious injury. Mm -hmm. And it's always interesting what kind of off the field role they end up taking during yeah. that injured time. Did anyone tell you like, this is how you can contribute off the field or did you just kind of fill in the holes yourself? My first ACL, I, I kind of had to ask, you know, because you don't want to like step on toes or overdo boundaries and stuff, but I wanted to still contribute. And a lot of during practice times, I would help out, but I would also be doing my rehab with our trainer at the time. So it was kind of a mix. I on away trips is when I felt I could contribute the most, whether that helps with meals, um, organizing the balls, all the little stuff. Um, but it was, it was kind of a mixture. Once I did, got into my second ACL, I was like, you know what? I mastered this <laughs> been hurt before. I know what to do. Let's go. Um, but the first time around, I definitely kind of had to figure out, okay, I'm not a, I'm not a soccer player right now. I'm injured. What can I do? And then did you have any, any mental struggles during that first ACL because you were so new to your college experience and suddenly you couldn't do anything? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the first ACL, I struggled mentally so much. Um, it was kind of one of those things. Uh, well, I guess rewind a little bit. One of the big questions that people would always ask me, my mom would always ask me, my dad is in the recruiting process. If you were to get hurt at this university, are you going to be okay at that university? And I was like, I'm never going to get hurt. Like I'll be fine. Yeah, sure. No, I got hurt. So <laughs> that question was really true. Um, so the first ACL, I struggled a ton mentally. And that's when I kind of started to utilize the, the mental performance coaches and try to just work through it. And it was hard. It was hard for me to buy in because I was a freshman going into sophomore year. Um, I didn't love life at that time. I wasn't getting, I felt like I was putting so much work in as an athlete and not really getting rewarded because I couldn't play. Um, and then I ended up having to get a second surgery in September with that knee. Um, so it just kind of felt like I wasn't getting rewarded and it was tough. It was really tough. Um, I got into a really dark place during that year, uh, with injuries, school was tough. Um, so I'd say, yeah, I struggled a ton mentally during that first ACL. And, and like I said, the second ACL, obviously I struggled mentally through that, but I kind of knew what to expect, uh, recovery and mentality. So I felt like the second one, I was more prepared and I just accepted what was going to come because I knew more. So during that first ACL, was there anyone else on the team that was similarly injured that you were going through rehab with, or were you the only one doing this? Um, oh gosh, that was a while ago. Let me think. There was one other athlete that was my grade. I don't know if she was doing rehab when I was, um, but there were two of my, my best friends at the time were going through ACL and then a broken leg 
during my second ACL. So we were a little group. I don't remember much on the first one, but second one, definitely. And then 30 months later, <laughs> you tear your, your second ACL on the other leg. Yeah. I mean, you barely had time to say, I can, I can play this, this sport again. Right. Or you were sidelined. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, that was tough. <laughs> Just mentally to grasp the idea of, I, I, it was my senior season. I was like, I'm done. That was my, the end of my soccer career. I'm done. That was hard. And it was a season opener too. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was tough. You thought, you thought you were back. Yeah. And then, I mean, you're sidelined another time with the same injury. Mm -hmm. And in, I just thought it was so interesting. Like in that, um, the video, they threw out some stats. Mm -hmm. Like after one ACL tear, the return percentage is 85%, which is solid. Like it's high. That's good. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then after two ACL tears, only 52% return to pre-injury sport. Yeah. And you're one, you're one of them. Yeah. I mean, how does it feel to be a statistic? And a, a positive one? I mean, you know, in the interview, my mom mentioned that if someone tells me I can't do something, I'm going to do it. Um and I, I think I become so stubborn in that sense, especially when it comes to like exercise and athletics. If you can't, if you tell me I, I can't do something, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to do it just to prove you wrong. And I think that was the biggest thing with the second ACL is I talked to so many people. And at one point I did have my mind made up. I was like, I'm done with college soccer. Um, and I talked to people and they're, I was like, what would you do in this situation? You tore both your ACLs. Are you going to keep playing? And they're like, no, like, you have so much more of life to live. And, and I kind of let that sink in for a little bit. And I thought I had my mind made up and then we got a new coach and he, he ended up talking me into staying. So, and I'm so happy I did. (laughs) And what was that conversation like? Because you had a new coach and you were thinking about leaving his program. Right. Did you sit down with him and say, okay, well, this is kind of my plan. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. This just isn't working out for me. Yeah. Well, with the the coach that before we have now, um, I was considering taking a fifth year. I just I wasn't sure. And then he left, went to a different university, and we got a new coach. And then that's when I was really like, okay, I'm not taking it. Um, I was back in BG. I think I was finishing up my senior year. It was right before COVID happened. And I went and talked to him, sat down in his office, just introduced myself as what I thought was going to be an alumni, but um, introduced myself, and he goes you want to play another season? I, and I laughed. I was like, no, <laughs> like, I, I've already torn both my ACLs. No, you're crazy. And he said that that's the thing. You've already torn both your ACLs. You've already done them. Why don't you play again? And I was like, you know what? It might be terrible logic, but you're not wrong. So yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and that's how, that's how I got talked into playing a fifth year. And then you, you have an exercise science bachelor's and are working on a kinesiology master's. Yep. As you were rehabbing simultaneously, did you start to see yourself in that coursework? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I hate to say it, but I think I learned more going through rehab than, than I have in the classroom. Um, they definitely correspond. And it was it was kind of fun to to apply things that I am learning in the classrooms and the different classes into what I was doing in rehab. So that that was fun. It was, it was fun to have a background in exercise science and then apply that to what I was dealing with in real life. And how do you want to use those two after you do leave? Yeah, see, I gotta, I gotta figure that out. Um, I definitely, I'm not exactly sure what I'm gonna do now, but I know that I wanna stay in either the medical field or the exercise field. Um, because of the things that I've gone through, I think I can really contribute to those fields. And just be like a, a shoulder to lean on for other people or even young women that are going through the same thing. Anything I can do to contribute and express my knowledge and sympathy for them, I want to do it. I want to help out however I can. And you're leaving Bowling Green with eight championships, four rings. I'd, I'd say it was a successful college experience. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Does that stat right there make you proud that you stayed with it? 
Oh, a hundred percent. My, my freshman year, it was a tough season. I don't even think we qualified for the, the Mac tournament that year. And then sophomore year turns around and we ended up, we lost in the championship, but we made it to the championship. And even then I was like, what just happened? We went from not even qualifying to the tournament to making the championship game. Like that's crazy. And then the, the next four years, what do I know? We're, we're max champions tournament and regular season. I would never have expected if you would have asked me freshman year, I would have laughed. So it made, it made it worth it. 110%. I mean, four consecutive Mac mm -hmm. championships, yeah. two in the same calendar year. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, you had, you had already torn both ACLs at that point. So was that difficult coming back and then two, two entire championship runs in the same year? Yeah. You know, I think that was kind of a blessing in disguise. Once COVID happened and they were trying to decide if we wanted to have season in the fall, that was right when I was coming back from my ACL. So I think our first preseason practice was my first practice back. And you know, I was out of shape. I hadn't touched a soccer ball and who knows how many months. So it was, it was a mess on my part, but I think them pushing that season back into the spring. And although, I mean, that's frustrating because you know, you want to play, you want to be rewarded with something. Um, it was frustrating, but it was a blessing, blessing in disguise. I was able to take that fall to really focus on my fitness and my technical and tactical abilities. And then ultimately, I really think it benefited us in the spring. And then the third straight championship was the first championship you played in as yeah. Green, and you ended yeah. up winning it. Mm -hmm. that what, was was fun. That, what was that like? I think, you know, Jimmy, our coach, uh, he always says that was the first one we actually won in regulation too, because the 2018 and 2019, we went to PKs and I didn't play in those. Um, but once we finally won in regulation and I was able to play, I was able to con contribute to that win. It just meant so much. It, it was definitely a different experience than the other two were. And one of the quotes that I pulled from that video that I just, I had to ask you about yeah. Your coach called you the best leader he's had the opportunity to work with. When you heard him say that, I mean, that's that's an incredible honor. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think he he labeled you as such? I was I was speechless when I heard him say that I it was one of the best compliments I've ever gotten from anybody. And it meant so much to hear it from him because I look up to him so much as a leader. I think he's an incredible person. He's an incredible coach and he's an incredible dad. He's awesome. And to have him say that to me, I can't, it meant so much. Um, but, you know, I, I think I get my leadership abilities and my drive from my mom. I look up to her so much and I want to be like her when I, when I grow up. Um, yeah, I, I look up to her so much and I, I try to just follow in her footsteps. I think she is such a powerful leader in her she's a um an accountant and at such a male dominated field and she's one of the only females in in her uh department i guess that i look up to her as a powerful women leader so much that's i mean how important is it to have those kind of role models not only so, in your not only in your sport but also outside in the real world <laughs> It's, it's so important. I think I'd be lost if I didn't have them. And I mean, I have so many incredible leaders that are all around me and I love surrounding myself with them because I just feed off their energy. I want to learn more. I want to know how I can become a leader, become a better woman. I, I, I just, whether it's me looking at Jimmy and how he leads or my mom or even my dad, I just, I want to feed off of everything that they can give me because I want to be the best I can be both in athletics, in life, and then in whatever career I take. What's the number one most impactful thing that you learned during that first ACL rehab? Ooh, the most impactful thing. And I'll ask you about the second one as well, but let's, <laughs> let's break it down. I think for the first one, like I said, I struggled most mentally during that one. I think it was just patience. Learn how to be patient. You can't force, you know, anything in life, but especially injuries, you can't force a comeback. And I, I know it's so hard with like coaches and, 
and other members saying, can you play, can you play, can you play? And you want to please them, but being able to be patient with your body, like your body is such a powerful, I don't even know. It's your body is so powerful that it's healing. You got to be patient with what it is. And then obviously do what you can to do to speed up that process, but you can't force it. So I think being patient during, during the first ACL was what I learned. Yeah. And then during the second, <laughs> well, since I was already, I already knew I had to be patient at some point. Um, I think the second one, the, the biggest thing I learned was everything happens for a region reason. I'm a religious person. So I think I always tell myself, you know what, God has a plan. I don't like his plan right now, but it's all a part of the plan. And I just, I got to go with it. You know, I, there's nothing I can do to change it. I'm also a big believer in control that what you can control. And I, that was out of my control. I, the only thing I could control is my work ethic, how I look at the situation and then try to find the little positives, whether I'm having an awful day or an awesome day, I need to find some kind of positive throughout that recovery process. When you know that you're healing, but you yourself can't do anything about it, how do you relinquish that control and just say, okay, my body's just doing it on its own time and my mind can't really assist at this point? Yeah, I mean, that's frustrating. And that's just me. I constantly have to remind myself, be patient, be patient. But there were bad days. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, the there were two other women that I was rehabbing with, and we we called ourselves <laughs> since I'm funny, we called ourselves the Goys. It stands for the group of idiots. That's what they would call us because we they, we would walk into the weight room and they're like, oh, the Goys are here again. But um, you know, we always talked about like if one of them was having a bad day, we'd try to pick it up, and vice versa. If I was having a bad day, they'd be like, Rach, you got to look at the positives. Like, stay strong, do what you can today, and tomorrow's a new day. So I think it was just kind of accepting what was thrown at you and trying to do your best with it. I mean, it's okay to have bad days. I have, I've had plenty of bad days, trust me. (laughs) And there were days where I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to play soccer. Like I'd rather just move back to Colorado, go start my life out there. But I just kept pushing and I, I think I, I milked it as much as I can. And that's, that's how I am where I am today. So what pushes you now? Um, with soccer, it was definitely the championships I wanted. And it was kind of, I wanted to tell myself, like, I've been through so much that I can do it. Like, I wanted to reward myself for the going through rehab and all the pain that I went through. I wanted to like, just prove to myself, you know, I can do this. People told me I can't, but I, they can tell me whatever, but I wanted to show like myself, like I can do this. I can be successful. So I think that was kind of the biggest thing with athletics that pushed me through that was just rewarding myself and proving to myself and in my family that I could do it. And a lot of athletes post-injury feel some kind of reluctance to get back to full throttle play. Yeah. Did you go through that with the first and then also the second ACL? And at what point did you realize, okay, now I'm officially fully back? Yeah. Um, I definitely did with both of them. That's scary. The, the first one, I I looked up a stat because I do have an exercise science background. So like, I know a little bit about ACLs at that time and I looked it up and it was, I could be completely off with this stat, but it was something like one in five retear their other ACL. And I was, it is awful mentality, but I was like, it's going to happen. Like, when is it going to happen? And that it, I hate to admit it, but I had that mentality. Um, and then sure enough, it did happen. Um, so it, I don't know. It was, it was really tough with both of them. And then did anyone help you through that process and say, okay, Rachel, like you have to, you have to get back at some point. You can't be scared of this forever. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone necessarily put it like that, but I would say the people that pushed me the most were my mom and dad. And they were so forgiving with me. You know, I, I, I call them every day, whether I was crying or having a great day, I would call them and my dad at the time, he was going through, he has cancer, he has bladder cancer and he was going through chemo. And, and then it came back my, I want to say my fifth year, year, it, it came back. And so just like having him and looking at him and how strong he was through the whole process. And he, he doesn't complain. <laughs> I mean, I know he doesn't like doing the chemo and stuff, but he's such a warrior that I was like, you know what? He has a bad, I've had it bad. Like why just, I mean, move on. Like, just keep, keep fighting. So they definitely were the two, my mom and dad that pushed me the most and inspired me. And then ultimately helped me make the decision to come back and play again. And then you finished 
the video finished off with your mom saying that she was going to be at every single game this season. Yeah. yeah. How important is that on your your victory lap season to have that, her in the stands? That that meant so much. I've, I've said it a million times, but me and my mom are like best friends. Um, so it, it was so nice to like look up in the stands and see her. And there were games where we would be playing two hours away from BG and she'd have to drive extra like four hours to get back to the airport on time to make the flight that night we were playing at like 3 p.m like she was all over ohio i i don't know how she did it i don't know how many miles she's traveled <laughs> but i i'm so thankful that she was able to come to every game the last season and it, that was also kind of like a rewarding feeling you know it like i i successfully did my rehab and and now my mom's here to watch me play and actually compete and contribute and that it meant so much so we're, we'll talk a little bit more about your mom. Yeah. When you called her the first time you tore your ACL and you said something's wrong. Yeah. And she was in Colorado. Yeah. What was that conversation like? Um, that was a tough one because I didn't know what an ACL tear felt like the first time. And so I called her and I was like, something is not okay. Like my knee hurts so bad. It, it feels like something just blew up in my knee. Um, that was hard. And it, it, you know, I, I think in the video, she said, I said that don't freak out. She's going to freak out, obviously, but <laughs> being so far away. And I was actually really lucky. My dad had come into town. He was driving my car out to Ohio and it was Valentine's day actually. So then he was going to take me out for dinner and he was there, um, when I had torn it that day, but we'd also, like I said, in the video, we didn't know that it was ACL. They thought it was like a little LCL sprain, rehab it two weeks and I'll be fine. And that wasn't the case, but it was nice to have him there as like a, as a moral support. <laughs> and then when you tore your other ACL, yeah, you called your mom again yeah. <laughs> and she was just like, what do we do now? Like, right. you're, you've done both of them. Yeah. How did the conversation differ that time? Because you had already been through one. No, it's funny because I think that one was the most emotional for her. Um, she was moving my younger brother into his college dorm. It was his freshman year. It was his birthday. Um, and she got a text from my best friend's mom who was at the game and said, like, Rachel went down. It's not good. Um, and so I, I remember FaceTiming her and she's already crying because she knows something happens. And I, I, I was like, mom, I'm okay. I know what I did. And I think that one just hit her the most because she couldn't be there and she wasn't watching the game, which I think ultimately was a blessing in disguise that she wasn't watching that game. But it was nice to have my best friend's mom there. She was the, our, the goalkeeper at the time. Um, but her mom came and was like banging on the door trying to get in. I was like, you can't come in. Like this is, it's all like locked in private facility. But it was kind of nice having like a second family there that, that was there to comfort me and see if I was okay and what I needed. And they have that, that non-contact second on yeah. video. Yeah. <laughs> How frequently do you look at that or do you? You know, I did a lot when it, when I first did it, because I love that kind of stuff. I love, that sounds, that sounds disgusting, but I love like watching those injuries and like seeing the biomechanics behind it and like what I did wrong. Um, I didn't watch it much after until they released the video. I watched it a few times again. Um, and I know a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, that's disgusting. But I'm like, I love that stuff. Like, <laughs> and it, it's funny because in the video, like you can't really see, it looks like I just fell to the ground. So it's not like gruesome. Like it looks like I tripped. And honestly, I wish I just tripped. <laughs> yeah. But, you just kind of crumple to the ground. Yeah. The play yeah. goes on behind you. It's I really know, I, interesting. I wish it looked cooler than what it was but no <laughs> I mean once that happened again and you were helped off the field mm -hmm. what did you say to your coach I honestly don't remember talking to my coach I I'm sure he said something I was so emotional at that moment but I do remember a lot of my teammates coming up to me some of them had tears in their eyes and they were like you don't know what it is and it, it <sighs> As much as you want to hear that and believe it, I knew what it was. Once I feel like once you tear your ACL the first time, you know the second time. And that's just speaking for myself. Like I knew. And it, it was frustrating when people were like, you don't, you don't know what it is. I, like I knew what it was. Um, but the teammates were awesome. They were so comforting to me. Yeah. I know the next morning we were leaving the hotel and my coach came up, put his arm around me, and he he mentioned that he was so I don't know if he said like frustrated. We ended up tying the game. 
Um, but with that result, and he was, he said, I don't know why I'm dwelling so much on this result when Rachel just tore her ACL and has a big smile on her face. So that, that kind of meant a lot. I just, try, I always try to find the positive in situations and I was, I was hurting, but all you can do is put a smile on your face and work through it. How do you find the positives in situations like that? I mean, it's not easy. No, no. You know, I don't think I found the positives in that for about a week. <laughs> and I just kind of let myself feel those emotions. I think that's how I grow as a person. You got to feel those, those negative and raw emotions. And that's what I did. Um, but then once I kind of started getting back into the swing of things, that's when I was like, you know what, if I can get through this recovery, like, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe I'll play again. Um, I can start to exercise and even little different like tasks that I could do during PT, like running was a huge one. Um, finally being able to do like a normal squat. It's the little things that you take advantage when you're fine that were massive when massive little milestones when I was doing rehab. And I think those were kind of the positives I tried to take out of out of that rehab uh, process. With such an, I, I say unpredictable, but there is kind of a, a timeline of return to play, but just overall with an injury that is relatively unpredictable in its rehab situation, what are those milestones and what does it feel like to finally reach them? <laughs> it, the, so the biggest milestones that I can remember in the, the rehab was running. Well, I guess if, I guess if you go to post-op walking normal, that's a, that's a big one. Um, and then you get running, jumping, you can start to incorporate ball exercises. Um, I think the most rewarding milestone was probably incorporating the ball exercises. I would always ask my PT, so can we do the ball? Or I'd be like, do I have to wear my brace? Can we do ball exercises now? <laughs> um, so using my sport in my rehab was the most rewarding during the, the rehab time. And then once you finally got back to play and you saw yourself just kind of get right back into it, was that, I mean, that was an amazing accomplishment in itself to mm -hmm. just be able to play fearlessly again. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I would say I went in and played fearlessly <laughs> right away. Um, I think the biggest, I mean, the, you can only do so much physically. I think the biggest barrier is your mentality through it all. And that's when I started to get those, those negative mindsets again, where, okay, if I go into this tackle, am I going to get hurt again? Or um, whether it's like a simple pass, am I going to mess this up? Can my knee even do this anymore? And I think the biggest thing was go going into tackles. Um, that's, it was terrifying. And for me, that was the biggest barrier mentally that I had to overcome and just trusting my body, trusting that I did what I needed to do off the field so that I could perform on the field. Um, it, the biggest barrier was my mentality at that time. So. And then once you saw yourself getting back into what you used to be, mm -hmm. how good of a step forward was that knowing that you still had time to come back, you still had eligibility left. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was really rewarding because I know a lot of times with ACLs, people say a lot of people will come back faster, quicker. Um, I don't necessarily believe that with the first one, but I do with the second one. I think I just had more drive to come back. Um, I was an upperclassman now at that time and, and I wanted to be the best I could be for my teammates and for my coaches and for my family. So that was kind of what was pushing me to do that. And looking back on it, I'm, I'm so thankful that I continued to push myself because it was so rewarding. The whole process, whether it was a tough day or a good day, it was so rewarding at the end. And then when you did come back and you were, I mean, helping your team to MAC championships, I mean, your teammates were seeing all of this and seeing you as a captain and seeing you come back from injuries times two. Yeah. I mean, did you ever have any teammates come up to you and say, Rachel, you inspire me? Yeah, uh, especially after that video that they released, I was so humbled and overwhelmed with just the kind words from, from my teammates, from admin, from my coaches, from people I've never talked to before. It was very overwhelming. And uh, yeah, I played with a, another center back, my right side center back, her name's Audrey, and she is one of the best players I've ever played with. And I told her, I always told her, I was like, you just, you make me look good. You do your thing and I got your back. <laughs> um, 
yeah, if in off the field, I have a, another really close friend that just tore her second ACL. And if there's anything I can do to be an inspiration to people like that or help out and help them through their journey or maybe find different things that maybe I struggled with that I could help them get through, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to help them however I can. When you see athletes who have injuries, not necessarily specific to ACLs, but just in general that sideline them for months, years, yeah. career, et cetera, what what are you thinking when you see stories like yours getting media attention? I, I think it's awesome. You know, it's, it feels so good to have similarities with other people, especially other athletes. I'm, I'm thankful that my, my two injuries weren't season ending um, and that I can still continue to be an athlete. Um, but it's just, it's inspiring to hear other people's stories. Everybody's uh, recovery process is unique. And I never want to tell them I know how they're feeling. I can sympathize with them, but everyone is so unique and the, their healing process is different. And so I just think having like a, a common ground that we can relate on, it's so important in finding someone that has a similar experience as you just like rely on to vent to at the end of the day, if you need someone just to be like, this is what I went through today. It sucked. <laughs> and then when you transitioned out of, of Bowling Green, out of the student athlete lifestyle, like what are you doing now? And are you implementing that kind of sport experience in the rest of your life? Yeah, so I'm very lucky that I can practice with the team if they need a, a fill-in player. I'll just jump in for practice. So I'm still kind of part of the team in that sense. And the, the teammates here are they're my best friends. So I hang out with them all the time. Um, but definitely, I, I haven't done the full transition out of sport yet. I'm still trying to kind of buffer that between like being a part of the team and training sometimes but also kind of taking a step back and just letting the team do their things I'm no longer part of it um so I think the transition officially when I graduate is going to be tough but I love exercise if I can be around women's soccer I would love to but I think that's going to be a tough tra tough transition when it gets there so who are you outside of your athletic participation yeah that's, that's funny because I, I've identified as an athlete for the longest time. You know, I've, I'm always in high school. I missed homecoming because I had a soccer tournament. Um, I had to not hang out with friends because I had soccer practice or I'd go from soccer to work. So, so my life has always been around sports. But, you know, I also I, I love music. <laughs> um, I play guitar and piano and I used to be involved in like choir and stuff and Music's always been a really good thing for me, whether I'm playing it or listening to it, just to kind of escape from the struggles and the real world kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be hard to kind of disassociate from being a student athlete. Um, but I'm, I'm a family person. I really value my family. I have a younger brother that we're, I'm super close with. And then my mom and dad and I have a dog. I have to mention him, of course, too, that I got uh, last February. So I love being outdoors. We're going to go on lots of hikes this summer. Um, but just trying to find myself outside of sport. I think it's going to be a struggle, but I'm excited for it. And I'm excited to learn more about who I am um, and just really experience adulthood, I guess. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about what you just mentioned, music as an escape. Yeah. I think that that's, it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. How did that play into your rehab processes? I think music is such a way to mentally escape, whether it's like happy music or sad music, or you know what, just, just normal music, I guess. Um, but I definitely had like days where I'd sit in my car and I have a playlist called Feels and I would just play it and I would just cry. And I think that's such a good, thing to do because you can't they say fake it till you make it but you can only fake it for so long so being able to use music as an escape and and kind of just let that take my emotions and just see where they were going it was it was really really beneficial in the recovery process and I always had I had one song that I listened to throughout my four years uh when I was going through the the ACLs it was it's called Just Be Held um and I think that song 
I cried to it. I screamed it at the top of my lungs. <laughs> it, it was such like a humbling song to me that I was like, you know what? I will be okay. This sucks right now, but I will be okay. And I, if, I, if I continue to give what I can give my best on whatever day it is, I'll get through this. And I think that was, that was how music kind of helped me through that. So what other songs are on that feels playlist? Oh gosh, let me, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, I haven't listened to it in a while, honestly. Good. Like, <laughs> right, that's a good thing. Uh, of course, I have Marvin's Room by Drake, classic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, Just Be Held is on there. Um, uh, I'll Find You by Tori Kelly and McRae. That was a big one. I still listen to that one on my bad days, but just anything that's kind of like reassuring, like I will be okay. Yeah. I think that a playlist like that, that you can simultaneously sob and scream sing to is, is exactly. doing what it's supposed to do. That's right. Yep. <laughs> and that's what it was used for. <laughs> and then is there anything else that I've missed talking about any other injuries that weren't ACL tears, but they you wanted to include in this culmination of injury history that we've been through today? um no injuries I mean I, I feel like some I call myself a liability because I felt like I always had something like there was one time I me and my uh roommate at the time were trying to make candles out of wine glasses and I cut my finger open so I had to play like the next three games with like a club hand like this um like just little stupid things like that but nothing as big as my my ACL is now and then is there anything else that you wanted to talk about before we conclude not that I can think of. I feel like we've touched on a lot of stuff. And then I always just include, is there any resource, any foundations that you would like to put links to in the show notes, anything that you want to support, any message that you want the listeners of this episode to take home? Not really. I guess like my biggest message for people is and I said this earlier, is control the controllables, be yourself and control the controllables. Life gets crazy and you got to pick and choose your battles. You can't pick them all and you can't win them all. So you might as well control what you can and, and move on, give your best. Uh, I know one thing our coaching staff says is give your best on that given day and your best night might not be your best, but as long as you're giving a hundred percent of what you can that day, you can't regret anything you've given. So that's kind of my biggest thing and what I, I live by now. So what in your mind signals that you're giving your best? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I, don't know, I think of it as like from soccer, if I wasn't feeling 100%, say I'm sore or it's the day after a game, is if I know that I am giving whatever I can contribute until I'm like, no, that is too much for me, I, I would consider that my best. If I can contribute to the team in a positive manner, maybe that's just like, the energy I'm spreading on the team. If I can be positive when it's like a down day for the team, that's what I'm going to try to do. So I don't think best always has to be like a physical measure. I think also it can be like what you're putting into the atmosphere and how you're helping the team as well. I mean, it's as much physical as it is mental. Right. I almost think it's more mental than it is physical at times. So, and then do your teammates talk about the mental side or I mean, what's the culture of mental health and mental health resource seeking behavior within BGSU's athletic department? Yeah. So with my team, I can only speak for my team because I don't know how other teams are handling with mental health and stuff, but my team does a pretty good job supporting like the overall mental health awareness. Um, everyone's going through their own situation, whether they're going through, I don't know, family stuff and injury, everyone's different. And that's kind of tough to talk about because you don't, it's, mental health is such a hard topic to talk about that you don't want to just be like, mm, this is what I'm struggling with today. This, 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 and this. And you, for me, I felt like if I was to do that, it'd be a burden. I don't want to put that on other people, but I think having each other's back. And, and my biggest thing is I always try to reach out to people and just check in and be like, Hey, how are you doing? Because that's what I would have wanted my freshman and sophomore year is someone just to have their arm around me. How can I help you today? Um, so mental health is a discussion that we have, but not personally, if that makes any sense. Um, but I know like Bernie, I mentioned earlier, she is a fantastic resource for us. Uh, I, I just go and I talk to her and I just vent. 
<laughs> as long as she's just someone to listen to me just blab I mean that that's the best I can get so how have you changed from 2016 to now oh my gosh I I've actually been thinking about that a lot um I think freshman year I came in I was immature I wanted to experience the college life I was so amazed by college athletics. I, I think the biggest thing freshman year, I was like, they actually do our own laundry. I was like, I, I thought I had to wash my clothes. No, that was, that was massive. But now like looking back on it, I have matured. I have grown so much as a woman. I feel like I am such a better leader now. I, I don't only lead by example, but I feel like I'm, I'm trying to lead and inspire younger women in sport, especially. Um, I just think I'm an overall better person. I, I've become more aware of different things in my life. And, and I, I just, I want to be able to help others and inspire others to kind of transition into that the way I did. And is there anything else that you wanted to talk about before we conclude? Just I don't think so. Four of yours. I don't think so. Awesome. So let's see when your episode is coming out. Okay, cool. I don't think it will be for another month or so. Okay. I am incredibly backlogged with stories <laughs> right now. It's been amazing. Let's see. And then also, if there's anything that happens between now and January, February, March, April, May 4th. Okay. So you have exactly a month. Sweet. <laughs> if there's anything that happens between now and then that you would like included in the story, send me a DM. Um, okay. send, me, send me an email just get in touch with me and I'll put it in the script and then I'll get back in touch once this is published Ooh. awesome thank you so much for spending some time with me telling your story I'm so excited to get to share it of course thanks for asking me I'm glad I could share my story yeah I'm so glad that we were that we were put in touch I I put um just kind of a feeler a feeler message out to this this group of um, sport creatives that I'm in and a guy from Bowling Green State um, direct messaged me and included the feature that they had done on you and said she would be great oh, and so awesome. like, it it was just perfect and I'm so glad that we got connected in the yeah. to, to tell your story because it's it's one of insane adversity and I'm just it's so amazing thank you thank you I appreciate it so May 4th um, once again, if there's anything that happens between now and then just get in touch with me and I'll add it to your story, but if there's nothing else, yeah. I'll talk to you then. Sweet. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good Bye. Rest of your day. Thanks. You too.